Well, welcome everyone to the 100th anniversary of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. What a remarkable way to begin the next century of wealth. <laughs> I'm Amy Goodman, host of Democracy Now! Yay! I hope many of you, your daily grassroots global, unembedded, independent, international investigative news hour that brings out the voices of the grassroots, that brings out the movements of people all over this country on the ground that are truly making history. You know, we got to cover the static. We live in a high-tech digital age when they hate static, right? You want the clearest television and radio and the perfect internet. But still, all that media ever brings us is static. Mm -hmm. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. When we, what we need the media to bring us is the dictionary definition of static. And that is criticism, mm -hmm. opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. Rock and on. We need, and we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. Like what we are experiencing with you today a thousand women once again, 100 years later, coming from around the globe, but this time including Africa, including Latin America, ever stronger in these ever more violent times. What a responsibility we all have. Whether we are journalists or activists, librarians, artists, activists, employed, unemployed, what an incredible responsibility when you look at what's happening in the Middle East, for us in the U.S. engaged in the longest war in the history of the United States and Afghanistan. When you look at Iraq, Yemen, the reason Tawakol is not here today. When we look at Syria, when we look at what's happening throughout the globe, it is the women on this stage, it is the women in the audience, it's the women in your communities at home together with the boys and the men and the girls, only people together speaking and having a media and ensuring that's a part of all of your activism that projects those voices. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, <laughs> so here we sit around this table for the next three days, and it's not just sitting. I mean, we know what happens when Rosa Parks just sits. <laughs> that is not just sitting. <laughs> when you do that kind of sitting, you are standing up for people all over the globe, because when one of us is oppressed, we are all oppressed. I want to start with Edith Miller Ballantyne, who perhaps, <laughs> perhaps today the oldest living member, active member of WILP. Edith, when did you become a member of the Women's International League? I joined, well, I became WILP, a member of WILP in 1941 in Toronto, Canada. You know, the, the, the Wilf women in Canada at the time um, made uh, uh, one of their peace activities to help what they called the new Canadians, the immigrants, the refugees who happened to come into Canada, just as Jane Addams had done in Chicago some years earlier. They had a settlement house. We were there as um, refugees from Hitler. I'm a Sudeten German political refugee. Uh, at the age of, um, I wasn't quite 16, when we had to leave uh, after Hitler. When Mr. Chamberlain gave away a piece of land that wasn't his, but it was the German part of uh, Czechoslovakia, a very new republic, 
Um, we became refugees because my family was very much engaged in the anti-Nazi activities. We got to Britain, and then in Britain they decided there were too many Germans, and peace hadn't been saved after all. So they shipped us off to Canada and, and to other dominions, their colonies still at the time. Um, we had a rather hard time. I, we, I think we almost did a kind of a slave labor uh, work. We were supposed to farm, and that became quite impossible. We drifted to the cities. I came to, to Toronto, where some other members had gone to, uh, and worked in a, as a maid in a, in a beautiful mansion. Uh, when I walked in, three people walked out with suitcases. It was the, the cook, the, the, the maid, and the nursemaid. And I replaced at the age of not quite 19, all three of them. I had no idea of how to cook or whatever. Anyway, there I was. And uh, I was there for about a month when the doorbell rang and the woman said, I'm from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. We understand there are so many political refugees here in Toronto. We want to bring you all together to our settlement house. And, and so we did. We went there and uh, my life changed because they, they reached out to us. They, they, Told, they told us our rights. They taught me English. We knew very little English then. And, and um, really made us feel part of the human community again. And they made me a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. I was very proud. I didn't quite know what it really meant. But anyway, it, it, it was a wonderful feeling to be part of that community. And I have felt uh, the organization you know, it's, it's a peace organization, it's an anti-war organization, but it's primarily a peace organization, a justice organization, uh, working for justice, understanding, and I have uh, been a member ever since. I think I may well be the oldest and the longest still active member in Wilf, I'm not sure. We won't com compete about age. <laughs> The issues that you were involved with, from 41, that was World War II, yes. talk about some of those struggles over the decades. Well, you know, uh, the women met in 1915 to stop the war. In 1919, they realized that the Versailles Peace Treaty was not a peace treaty, it was just the seeds for another war, and they were so right that this was so. So in 1919, when they met in Congress, in their second Congress, uh, they decided to become a permanent member, a permanent organization. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I wish all these old uh, 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 Congress reports and their discussions were easily available. Mm. It is really, I learned so much from reading these, these um, discussions. And you know, they, with the little <laughs> technology they had at the time, they were able to write these reports in three languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and every, everything that was said is, is recorded. It's fascinating reading. Uh, we also published a, a book for the 50th anniversary, uh, which was the first 50 years of history of the WILPF and um, chronological developments. It's a fascinating book to read. Um, it's out of print. I wish we could reprint it. Uh, anyway, I, I became very much involved in, well, we, you know, I was born into a political family. We fought Nazism and fascism. And uh, so I felt very much at home in the Wilf because they were also talking politics. And what was so remarkable to me, you know, I, I, I'm, I was born into a socialist family, and so the women in Toronto really were talking. They, you know, they were not. They were talking about what is needed, what kind of society do we need to build, on which a, an endurable peace, peace could be constructed. And you know, from a very early time on, they began to look at the economic and social system. And, and you know, this is 1919 with a revolution in, in, in uh, Russia and so on. 
and they really thought there, there must be an alternative system to capitalism, which we could already then uh, not really cope, certainly not after the Second World War, could, could cope with the challenges that they had then. And today, you know, we know the system does not work. And we are still afraid, and we talk less now in the peace movement about having to change this fundamental system so that peace has a chance. As long as this competition goes on, you know, one, one people against another. And, and, and today, you know, it's not even just an economic competition. We are complete slaves of a financial uh, casino. Uh, what chance do we have? So we need to do it, we need to really look at this and begin to, whatever we do, also think in terms, how will that help? to transform our society. Hmm. So, so that's my... <laughs> so the question of how we transform society. Um, Jody Williams, you won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997. You in the international campaign to ban landmines. Um, <laughs> it's... It's almost two decades later now. Mm. And now you're taking on a new um, uh, project, Killer Robots. Talk about the trajectory, and in particular, your strategies for organizing. Mm -hmm. First, I want to say happy birthday to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thank and you. Thank you. <laughs> Wayne, I'm going to bow to you. Oh. <laughs> I'll do you a minor wave, because you're, you're the queen of Wilkes now. <laughs> If I could get down on my knees and get back up again, which would not be possible. Would you like me to help you? Oh, I mean, I can get on my knees? <laughs> of course. Oh, no. <laughs> can I hug you? Yeah. <laughs> no, you are. I, I, I think I've lost my ear. Well, well okay. Wilf gave me permission to stand up, so I'm going to. I mean, 93 years old. Right? And a half. Oh, wait, wait. She amended 93 and a half. <laughs> Let us all hope that we still have the vim, vigor, and drive to continue to transform this world in desperate need of it. Thank you. I am proud to be your sister in peace. I'm going to step down for just a minute. Can you read that? That is unarmed civilian. It grew out of the murders of African Americans in the United States of America by police. If you want one of your very own, Google unarmed civilian and you can purchase one. We, 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 and I'm not talking we, we, oink, oink, the pig, we. We, what is a movement? What made the landmine movement a movement? What makes the effort now to stop killer robots, which are machines that on their own will be able to target and kill humans? On their own, they will be set free. There will be no human being targeting. There will be no human being firing. The machine itself will kill you. Human beings, men, I'm sorry to say, are so depraved that they are crossing a moral and ethical divide, deciding that it is okay to cede the power of life and death over other human beings to machines. We will win. We will stop it. Because we are we. What makes movement is we. When I hear anyone in the movement start to say I an awful lot, I get extremely, extremely nervous. Mm -hmm. If anyone thinks that they alone have the power to change the world, I want to know what they are smoking. <laughs> And 
And they can say it's medicinal, I don't care. <laughs> no one human being ever, ever, ever changes the world. The reason we change the world on landmines is because we came together in a common cause. And we talk about we. The women's movement will change this world because we know as women that we are we. That's what makes us different from men. Not that we're better, although I happen to think we are. <laughs> but we are different. And I just give the example of the Nobel Women's Initiative. As soon as we knew that we had enough of us to be an initiative, thank you, Sharin Abadi, for the idea, Dr. Abadi. We came together and created the Nobel Women's Initiative to use the Nobel Prize. I mean, what is it? What is it? It's a thing. We use it together to help spotlight the work of women around the world in the movement to bring peace to the world. We, 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 we. I would just point out that in the history of the Nobel Prize, I think there have been now, wait, let me think, 15, 16 women. There have been something like 95 men. 95 men, no surprise, it's a sexist prize. <laughs> I want to also note, there has never been a Nobel Men's Initiative. <laughs> I say this not to denigrate men. There are some great feminist men but there is something different about women when immediately if we see a bunch of us, we become a, a, a we. We're a we, we're not a me. If you ever hear me say I too many times in a row, remind me that I'm getting a little <laughs> out of control. We need to reclaim peace, which is one of the things that I think we were able to do a little bit with banning landmines banning blinding laser weapons before they ever became a weapon on the battlefield, blinding, <laughs> banning cluster munitions, the massive movement now in the streets, in their face, to ban nuclear weapons. We are being held hostage. 80% of the world does not want nuclear weapons. A handful of nations are holding us hostage. Men who see these missiles, as an extension of their manliness. <laughs> we can no longer be hostage to that. We can no longer hear all of those peaceniks, you know, those utopian fruitcakes who do not understand the reality of the world. We understand the reality of the world. The reality of the world is that those in power do not want to give it up. The reality of the world is that men make shitloads of money, excuse my English, off weapons. The reality of the world is that war is glorified and made to look heroic. It is not heroic. What is heroic is that sometimes human beings in battle behave heroically to save people. That is heroic. Killing other people in the name of your country or patriotism or stealing the oil under somebody else's sand, that is not heroic. What is heroic is when people come together, whether it's banning landmines, banning killer robots, stopping the arms trade, working together to bring about the International Criminal Court, all of the things that are happening, working together to save the freaking planet. That is heroic. It is unarmed civilians coming together to change the world, to reclaim nonviolence. I would rather have a nonviolent Sharina Body, a nonviolent Lema Gaboe, a nonviolent world loving Maraid, wherever you are again, a nonviolent Sharin, a nonviolent Rosa Parks at my back than some idiot with a gun. Anybody can shoot a gun. 
we understand that if we really want to transform the world and find paths to permanent peace, it has to be by reclaiming peace and recognizing how many minutes I got. You can tell me to shut up. Uh, you've got two minutes. Okay. <laughs> that new path to permanent peace means reclaiming peace. That it is not the absence of armed conflict. It is human security. It is not letting men dis <laughs> right. It is not letting men in that UN, which we are not talking about, sit there and write resolutions like 1325, 1820, 20, I can't even remember all the numbers, about women, peace, and security, and telling us, telling the women, granting us the right to be participants in defining our own security. Hello, you've messed it up for millennia. We don't need you to tell us. We women know what is security. It's food on the table. It is a house to live in. It is Medicare, not Medicare, sorry, wrong country. It is access to medical care. It is a dignified job so that you can raise your children. It is take all that money that is put to the weapons of war and death and use it for a better world. That is security. That's human security. And women know it, and we are not going to let the men tell us anymore what makes us secure. They make us insecure. I have a good one of my own. I love him. He's a feminist. He works on stuff we do. But unfortunately, the overwhelming majority like the missiles. <laughs> Enough. Just like Lema and the women of Liberia stood outside the negotiating rooms, and would not let them out till they did something meaningful. From now on, I suggest that maybe when we are not allowed in the rooms, as in attempts at negotiating something for Syria, when Mr. Brahimi, the representative of the UN, said, what, women in the room? What, what? That's not the business of the UN. I'm like, wait a minute. 1325. Maybe we should just sit outside. We can invite Lema to every peace negotiation and we sit there. <laughs> I'm going over. I'll, I'll, I promise I'll stop. When they have man panels, right? Man panels. <coughs> Men making themselves famous and experts by reinviting themselves to every security discussion. We need to stop that, and we in the non-governmental organization movement that's banning weapons, we have pledged to not participate in man panels. No more man panels, we ain't going. I end with nothing about us without us. Just as the landmine survivors who became the biggest advocates for getting rid of landmines said nothing about us without us. Just as the people with disabilities, when the, when the treaty for disabilities was being negotiated and they were there advocating because they know disability, they live it every day, nothing about us without us. Just like we women who are part of the survivors of sexual violence and conflict united for action. We are stepping up and speaking up because nothing about us without us. We women are more than 50% of this planet. Enough, gentlemen, nothing about us without us. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting me stand.